Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, January Daring to Learn session. This is our first uh, webinar session for 2024. If this is your first time joining us um, for the Daring to Learn value-added webinar series, welcome. Um, a lot of you are returning. This is a pretty big group. Uh, so it looks like we've got about um, 16 folks on this morning. Um, so that's great. Um, and our session title today is Optimizing Your Website for More Traffic. So we have Travis Key uh, with TK Digital Marketing um, here to talk with us today. And I will go ahead and let him kind of give a brief introduction. Uh, Travis, if you want to go ahead. Okay, sure. Let me go ahead and uh, can I go ahead and share my screen and start the uh, <clears throat> presentation here. There we go. So my name is Travis Key. I have a company called TK Digital Marketing. Uh, we're down here in South Georgia, um, just a little bit, uh, about an hour north of Tallahassee, Florida. So I build websites, do online uh, advertising campaigns, do SEO optimization of websites, do content consulting, a lot of different stuff on the digital web side of things. We also have a company called Lazy Dog Farm. We do YouTube videos, well, gardening stuff, have a website, sell some products and fig trees on that website. And I'll be sharing several examples of our Lazy Dog Farm stuff as we go through the presentation today. And I'll be sure to stick around once I'm done. Um, I don't know how long the, the Zoom lasts, but I'll stick around and, and answer some questions if any of you have any. Um, once we're done. So well, with all that being said, let's jump in. We're going to talk about, you know, optimizing your website for more traffic using what something we call search engine optimization, kind of go through some of the nuts and bolts of that and why you want to have that on your website. Before we get into the search engine optimization stuff, I always like to kind of, you know, explain what we're trying to do with a website and every website has different goals. I'm sure, you know, just with our audience today, we've got different people who, you know, some may sell stuff online, some may have different objectives for the website. So it's important to kind of clarify upfront, what's the goal of your website. So, you know, a lot of websites are going to sell things online. We call those e-commerce websites. So their goal is to drive direct sales. Here's one of my clients, um, up near the Atlanta area that makes his own uh, goat milk soap from goats he has on his farm and sells them online. So for people visiting his website, his goal is to sell them some soap. So that's kind of the e-commerce goal is to drive direct sales. We also have other websites out there, other companies. They may not sell things online, but maybe they have like a brick and mortar store. And so they're just using their website uh, to get exposure and to try to get people to come visit their physical store. This is actually my father-in-law's business. He owns a boat place, and does boat repair, boat accessories, boat sales, that kind of thing. So with his website, we're just trying to show all the different things he offers, all the different kind of new boats he sells. We have his you know, used boats listed here, talk about the different accessories he installs, that kind of thing. We want to provide that information to website visitors so that they're more likely to come visit his store and, and purchase something there. Another type of um, goal you might have for a website is, is to collect leads. So maybe you're not selling anything online. Maybe you don't have a physical brick and mortar location where you sell things. Maybe you're in more of a service industry and you want to collect leads. So this is actually... Um, from my wife's website she's an attorney and so on her website we have this little contact form or this lead collection form sprinkled all over her website because that's the goal of her website she wants to get people to fill out that form and contact her for legal services that she can provide this is also applicable um, not only in the the legal service industry but say you're a insurance salesman say you're a real estate broker uh, those kind of people, more service-based, are going to be wanting to collect leads with their website as opposed to, um, you know, getting people to buy something online. Other types of websites we have out there just provide news and information. I use ESPN as an example here. People might go to ESPN.com to 
you know, see what the score is on the ball game or read news about their favorite team. And then ESPN will monetize their content with ads and different stuff like that. But a lot of websites, you know, other news sites um, are just out there to provide information and then they figure out ways to monetize that information. You, you know, your website may be more informative than it is driving sales or acquiring customers, just depending on your business model. And then we have other websites out there that are just designed to create awareness, um, you know, for particular calls or something like that. So, you know, they're listing, you know, why their calls is important and their goal is just to get people to join their calls. A lot of times websites like this will have an email newsletter sign up for them so they can send updates and kind of rally people around their calls. Um, so as you can see here, there's a lot of different goals you can have for a particular website. Not every website selling something, not every website is acquiring leads, but every website should have a purpose and goal in mind. And the structure of your website and the content should be centered around that goal. Let's talk about real quick some website mistakes I see. And I like to mention this because in, in my industry, I see it far too too often and so i'm just going to mention a couple here uh and, and hopefully this will be helpful if you're looking to build a website for your company you don't already have one or maybe you've made some of these mistakes and you kind of you'll kind of understand how to correct them going forward so one of the big things out there right now that just came about in the last few years is you know this whole anybody can build a website thing. And that's true. Anybody can build a website with a lot of these drag and drop DIY website builders out there. The problem with these is they don't always give you access to all the nuts and bolts of the back end of the website that you really need to be able to access to do some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. None of the stuff we're talking about today is really complicated. You don't have to be a coder or no how to write code to do this stuff, but you do need to be able to access this stuff on the back end of your website. So yes, anyone can build a website with a lot of the platforms out there today, but you know it's not always the best idea to go this route. The other big you know mistake I see a lot of times is just hiring the wrong person to build your website. If you're going to hire somebody to build your website, a lot of companies will you know they got a tech savvy friend or relative that they, you know, get to build their website pretty cheap. And what happens here is while that person may be able to build a website that looks good, a lot of times they don't know about all this stuff on the back end that we're going to be talking about today that you need to do and tighten up to really get your website to appear in Google search results. So, you know, just be careful about who you hire um, and make sure they're, in, you know, an expert in what they're doing, make sure they they really understand the ins and outs of a website, not just the physical appearance of it, but all the things that go into the back end that help you out, um, help you show up in the search results. Another big issue I see a lot of times is these agencies farming off their website building. So, you know, companies like myself, I see them all the time. They claim, you know, they can build you a website and do all this, but what they end up doing is just, kind of mocking up the design and then they sub it out and farm it off a lot of times overseas and that can end up hurting you in the long run. So if you're hiring an agency to build you a website, I highly recommend, you know, ask them a lot of questions, ask them, are you doing this in house or are you farming it off? You want to make sure they're doing it in house, make sure they understand all the ins and outs of it before you sign a contract with them for them to help you out. All right, let's talk about some website platforms real quick. Um, my favorite two, the, the two I use the most are WordPress and Shopify. Uh, WordPress has been around for quite a while. Shopify has kind of came on the scene big time here in the last five years. So these are the, the main two platforms I use with my clients. WordPress is um, what I use if we're building an informative website, a website for a service-based business. And then we use Shopify for e-commerce. So somebody that's selling something online. Now, WordPress does have e-commerce capabilities as well. But Shopify has made leaps and bounds um, with their e-commerce website platform in the last few years. And so I actually like Shopify better for e-commerce than I do WordPress. 
but if it's just information or acquiring leads, WordPress works great. And just to be clear, I don't, I don't, you know, have any uh, affiliation with these companies. I don't get a commission from them or anything like that. It's just my experience is building websites over the years, the best platforms out there. Since those are the best, but like I should mention, uh, if you can help it, try to stay away from some of the, um, you know, those DIY uh, type website builders out there. And, and I'm just not a big fan of Wix and Squarespace. I know a lot of people may be using them. I run into clients all the time that they started out with Wix and Squarespace. That was their first ever website, but they, they see now the need to really, you know, build a more robust website. They end up going with something like WordPress or Shopify. So yes, you can build a website with Wix or Squarespace or some of those other kind of easy website builders out there. But a lot of times you don't get the SEO functionality that you need to really have your website appear high in Google search results. So um, if you've already got a Wix or Squarespace website, no worries. Um, but if you're looking to build one for the first time or get a new website, I would try to discourage you against those two particular platforms. Okay, so now let's kind of dig into the meat of the presentation and talk about SEO itself. So what is SEO? Um, it just stands, it's an acronym, stands for search engine optimization. You know, that's a big phrase. You throw that phrase around, not a lot of people know what you're talking about. So I'll try to clarify it here a little bit. So what search engine optimization does is it, it's going to increase the chances of your site appearing in search results. So I've taken a screenshot here uh, from Google and I searched the term LSU figs. And this is where we'll talk about my other business, Lazy Dog Farm, a little bit. So we sell fig trees on our website. And LSU back in the 50s had a fig breeding program. And then they released a lot of varieties in the 90s. So they developed a lot of fig varieties over the years. And uh, we carry some of those varieties on our site. And so if someone is searching for LSU fig information or LSU fig trees, we want to make sure we appear high up on the page in Google search results so people, you know, come to our website to either buy LSU fig trees or learn more about LSU fig varieties. So when we type in Google, into Google here, LSU figs, we can see the first two results that pop up are, you know, an article from LSU, which makes sense. They develop a lot of these varieties. They got a lot of content on them. But right down here below them, we pop up here with our particular listing for an LSU gold fig tree. So these are what we call organic search listings. These are not paid search listings. They don't have the little paid uh, button beside them. And this is where we want to rank for certain terms. So depending on what products we offer, what services we offer, there are certain terms we want to rank for in Google, meaning we want to appear on that first page of results and as high on that first page of results as we can. Not many people ever click through to the second or third search results page on Google. So uh, if somebody's searching for a product or services you carry, you want to make sure you're, you're showing up high on the Google search results page. And so this is what we call organic search rankings. And we want to make sure we rank high in these organic search results and search engine optimization. A lot of the things we're going to talk about today allow you to do that or help you do that better. Close this chat window here. Okay, so why is SEO important? Uh, I always tell people that SEO is, is free advertising, but I put that in quotations because it's not necessarily free. It, it does take a good bit of work to get some of these things implemented on your website. But once you implement them on your website, they're there for the duration. So it's, it's a good bit of work up front, as we'll see in a minute. But once you have that real estate in Google search results, you just, you know, it's just compounding you know, day over day, month over month, year over year, you're getting that free exposure. You're not having to pay for that placement on the Google search result page. You know, having really good SEO is going to allow you to rank higher than your competitors. So on this page I showed you earlier, um, 
where I showed you those search results, right below our search listing, couldn't fit it in the screenshot, was several fig tree listings from companies much bigger than my Lazy Dog Farm Company, companies that have been around for decades, that get significant more traffic than we get on our website. But by doing this SEO stuff, we are able to rank higher than these companies that have a lot deeper pockets than we have. So it's a way to get a competitive advantage in your industry because you know you can do these things, outrank these other companies um, that would easily be able to outspend you on paid advertising, but you can outrank them organically with good SEO. This is going to allow you to spend less on pay, paid ads. So, you know, some companies I've worked with, they've been able to completely ditch paid ads. So they want to use, you know, Google ads to show up when somebody searched for a particular term. But as they develop good SEO over um, the years, they don't really have to pay for that placement anymore because they're getting it organically. And then some companies just kind of really scale back on their paid ads uh, once they get their SEO really turning and working for them. By spending less on paid ads, obviously you're going to be able to improve profit margins the less you spend on advertising and getting online exposure, getting traffic to your website, you know, the more money you put in your pocket or your, your business account or whatever. And then traffic is going to lead to conversion. So the more traffic we can get, the more eyes we can put on our website via those Google organic search results is going to lead to more conversions, whatever those conversions might be for your business. It could be direct sales, like we mentioned earlier, it could be lead acquisition, it could be getting people to sign up for an email newsletter. You know, conversions vary. Um, the definition of a conversion varies from business to business, but the more traffic we get, the more conversions we should get. So how does all this work? Um, how does how do we make sure our site shows up high in these Google search results? Well, there's a lot of factors at play here. Today, we're going to cover kind of these first two on the list, but I did want to mention all the things that kind of go into your organic search listing uh, and your SEO as a whole. So You've got the website nuts and bolts, as I like to call it. We're going to talk about that here in a minute, things you can do there. Website content, you know, what kind of informative educational content do you have on your website? Uh, social media presence is also going to play into your organic search ranking. You know, your Instagram followers, your Instagram page, your Facebook page, those kind of things play into it. YouTube, if you have a YouTube channel. Um, that's a great thing because you can connect that to your website, verify it through your website and Google knows, okay, this website is also, you know, has a really nice presence on YouTube. So that kind of gives you a little more verification in the search algorithm. Web traffic helps. So the more web traffic you get, the more Google thinks, okay, this is a legit website. I'm going to promote it more in these organic search rankings. So it's a little bit of a popularity contest there. Reviews also help. The more good reviews you've got, the more likely Google is to put you high up in those organic search rankings. Backlinks help as well. So that's when another website on their website has a link to your website. So if you have, you know, uh, other companies, you know, that don't mind putting a link to your site on their site and that kind of thing. That really helps out. Google looks at that looks at that as a good thing because you've got other companies vouching for you on their website. And there's a lot of other things that go into it as well. Search engine algorithms, whether it be Google or Bing, whatever, are extremely complex. Nobody really knows exactly how they work. Nobody knows exactly how each of these factors are weighted in the search algorithms and, and the algorithms are always changing things like google changes theirs about once a year um, so it's it's hard to keep up with it hard to know for sure you know which of these things is of utmost importance they're all great things to be doing you can see our search listing here i took a few screenshots so that's our home page it says lazy dog farm fig trees for your backyard now if you've got pretty good seo on your website google would give you these additional four links down here. Those are called site links. 
Now, you really can't control what site links Google puts there, but if you've got good SEO, you know, you want to be seeing those site links so people can see the different pages or some of the different pages you have on your website. If we look below that, we can see our reviews right there. Like I said, Google's going to factor that in. And then down below, an additional screenshot I took that, that fell right below this one. You've, we've got our YouTube channel right there. We've got our Facebook page, our Instagram. So that goes to show you all these things go into play as far as, you know, generating your reputation with Google and improving your Google search listing. Okay, so the basic premise of SEO and all this stuff is I like to tell people, tell my clients I always think of your website like a blog. So I can remember, you know, back when I was in undergrad, way back in the day, um, and even before that, when when the internet was just starting out, when websites were just starting out, you couldn't buy anything online. Most all websites were just blogs. Uh, you had some news websites that looked a little more fancy than just your run-of-the-mill blog. But at, at one point, everything online was just blogs. And we still need to kind of think of websites like that today. Now, we want to dress them up. We don't want it to look like some blog from the uh, late 1990s. We want it to look visually appealing. But we want to, you know, arrange our content on our website and write our content as if every page is like a blog. So we want to have really good descriptions. We want to have a lot of copy and text on our pages, really good information that's stacked with keywords. Content is king. So here's an example. This is a client of mine that has a pond management business here in South Georgia. And I write blogs for their website. Um, on a lot of different topics, we write blogs for uh, about, you know, fish population management and ponds, vegetation management and ponds, basically anything that could relate to pond management, whether it be fish, vegetation, water quality, all kinds of things. And the reason we write these blogs is because people are out there searching for how to manage this weed or how to manage that weed in their pond. And if we've got this information on the web. We can get those people to our website. And if they're within the service range, they're more likely to fill out that contact us form, contact these guys and become a customer. So, you know, having this really good informative content allows this company to really kind of hone in on their niche customer because, you know, be honest, they're not their customer base is is not a wide demographic. You know, it's only for people who own ponds or lakes or things like that. So um, kind of a small client base, but by writing these very specific articles that people would be, you know, looking for answers to online, we can really get some um, nice traffic to their website for people who would be interested in their services. Okay, so as we're doing this, I always like to tell people don't cheat because there's a lot of cheaters out there. And sometimes the cheaters get rewarded, but long term, you know, there's no, nobody wins from cheating. So let me kind of give you some examples of what I mean here by not cheating. So when you're writing content for your website, a big no-no is copying text from another site. We see this a lot in the vegetable seed industry. Uh, I took a couple screenshots here to show you. So uh, what we've got going on up top here is a listing from Bejo Seeds. So Bejo Seeds is the um, breeder for this particular variety of Brussels sprouts called Dagan, and it's an F1 hybrid. So they are the breeder, but they don't sell directly on their website. They have uh, online seed retailers and stores that sell these seeds. So Bejo is just a basically uh, a wholesaler of this particular variety and then they have other companies sell them for them so then high mowing seeds is a retailer for this particular brussels sprouts variety called dagan and you can see here in their google listing oh let me go back they have in the first line of text here they have the exact same text as bejo seeds does on their website you like i said you see this a lot in the seed industry the breeder 
will have written a description for a particular variety. And then the retailers, they just copy and paste that onto their website. And that's not something you want to do. You can use this information here. Just rewrite it in your own words. Don't copy and paste it from another website because Google kind of looks down on that. You want to um, rewrite it in your own words. I always tell people when you're writing product pages or, you know, pages for services you offer, if, if there is something you're kind of going by, instead of copying and pasting it, you know, just go through, like I would go through this Bejo Seeds listing here and just make some bullet points on a piece of paper. Do it the old school way. Make some bullet points of the highlights of this particular product and then sit down and rewrite it yourself. That's the best way to do it. That way you've got unique content on your site. Uh, Another thing you don't want to do is using the same copy on each page. So you don't want to just um, have the same lines of text on each page. Sometimes it's hard to get around this. I'll use the seed industry as another example. For instance, if high mowing seeds here has, um, say they have 10 different varieties of Brussels sprouts. On each of their Brussels sprout seed variety pages, they may have a little blurb down at the bottom that gives some Brussels sprouts growing tips. And people like to see that kind of stuff. But you don't want to get overly repetitive with content from one page to the next. You want each page to have kind of its own unique copy or content text, whatever you want to call it. Another way you don't want to cheat is by using um, artificial intelligence outputs. Um, not sure if a lot of y'all have played around with chat GPT yet, but it's a very powerful tool. I use it a lot in my business. Uh, just to kind of give me ideas. And it's really good if you're kind of having a brain cramp, you're sitting down to write a blog or a product description or something like that. Having a brain cramp, you just need something to kind of spur um, your thinking cap a little bit. So you can you can ask chat B GPT anything and it's, it's a free service and it's gonna just spit out all this information here. So I could, you know, I could take this if I wanted to and copy and paste that into a blog. Boom, I've got a new blog on my website, but I really don't want to do that. So I can use this as kind of a starting point, give me some good information, but I want to make sure I, I put this information in my own words. So I could use these bullet points here, increase visibility, improve user experience, higher credibility and trust. I might reorder those a little bit. And but I want to, like I said, rewrite this in my own words. I don't want to just copy and paste these chat GPT uh, outputs onto my website because Google's gotten where they're catching on to that. The last thing you don't want to do is be like the old recipe bloggers. I'm sure you've been to a recipe site at some point uh, or you searched a recipe on Google and you go to their website you go to that web page and you have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll until you actually find the recipe. It's just text and text and ads and text. And then finally, way at the bottom is the actual recipe. So the recipe bloggers were really good at SEO uh, back in the day. They knew how to do it. So they would write these long, long stories about a recipe or ingredients in the recipe, stack all that text full of keywords and it worked really well got them a lot of web traffic i'm sure they made a lot of money off putting ads on their site but eventually google kind of caught on to what they were doing just all this text and stacking it with keywords so while we do want to have a lot of good keywords in the copy or the text on our website we don't want to go overboard with it like the recipe folks did and, and we want to give people we don't want to make people work too hard to find what they were looking for. If you go to a recipe page, you're looking for the recipe. You're not really interested in reading this long story. So we don't, we don't want to make it too difficult for people to find what they're looking for. Okay, so now let's talk about the right way to do SEO. And um, it's important to note, as I'm going through all this, all this stuff that I'm talking about is not hard to do. You will need access to the back end of your website. If you had a company to build your website, I would highly recommend you learning how to work the back end of it, learning how to access the back end of it. That's, you know, when I say back end, that's just where the product pages are written um, and some of the website settings are. You need to be familiar with that if you're a business owner and have a website or you're on a marketing team and manage a website. 
Um, so none of this stuff, like I said earlier, requires any coding experience or anything like that. It's just writing, but there's there's techniques to it and ways that we want to do it. So here I've got a screenshot from a product on our Lazy Dog Farm website. Website. This is a product we sell, a chicken manure-based fertilizer called Coop Grow, and then you can see kind of a piece of the product description down below. So the first thing we want to do for any page on any website is set what we call a focus keyword. Now, I'll show you some apps here towards the end where you can actually tell the app what the focus keyword for each page is. Well, this is just kind of an arbitrary um, abstract thing where it, this focus keyword is just a, a word or a phrase that you're going to focus on as you're writing this page and you're going to sprinkle in that keyword in certain places. And you do that because you want this page to rank when somebody is searching for that keyword on Google. So for instance, with this Coop Grow fertilizer here, you know, my focus keyword for this page could be organic fertilizer. It could be Coop Grow fertilizer. It could be uh, chicken manure fertilizer. I could choose several different things, several different words or phrases to really focus in on and be my focus keyword. And it all goes back to what terms, what search terms you're wanting your products or your pages to rank for. Um, I, you know, when we're doing an SEO, SEO overhaul on a, a website, I always like to create a Google spreadsheet and list, you know, each web page and then write down right in a column right beside it what the focus keyword for each page is before we start doing any writing and any uh, search engine optimization. So we kind of know, okay, what we're doing here. A lot of times we'll do some keyword research. There's apps out there where you can see which keywords or which words or phrases are being searched more in Google. We can use that to really direct us. Okay, this is what we need our focus keywords on our website to be. These are the words and phrases we need to have on our website more than others. You don't want to use the same focus keyword on multiple pages. This can get a little tricky. Uh, if you've got a lot of similar products, like for example, we've got, I think 15 or so different fig tree varieties on our website currently. I don't want to use fig tree as the focus keyword for every single one of those pages. I want to mix it up and maybe, you know, have LSU fig as a keyword on one page, have variety names as a keyword, you know, different stuff in there. You don't, you don't want to focus on the same keyword every page because you're wanting to rank for more than just one word or one term. You're wanting to rank for several different terms, hopefully. And that's why you need to have different focus keywords for each page. This focus keyword or phrase, you want to have it in about one to 2.5% of the text on a given page. And this goes back to not cheating like the recipe bloggers out there. And they they were just stacking these keywords in the text just, you know, way higher than 2.5%. But Google's called on to that over the years. So we want it sprinkled in there, but we don't want it, you know, we don't want to overdo it. And as I'll show you in a minute, there are apps that will tell you, okay, what percentage uh, of your text features that focus keyword. You, if you want to do it really old school, you could, you know, put the text that's going on your web page, put it in a Word document, do a Word count, and then count how many times you've got that phrase in there. But as I'll show you towards the end, there are apps that can help with this. We also want to make sure that each of our pages on our website has at least 600 words or more. If it's you know, 800 to 1,000 words, that's even better. But I always tell people, you know, at least 600 words. You see far too often, especially people selling stuff online, their product pages will just have one or two lines here or just a couple of bullet points describing the product, and that's it. They're not taking advantage of all the SEO opportunities that are out there by writing this text. So we try to have 600 words of text on on almost all of our pages, when I build a website, whether it be service-based or e-commerce or whatever, we want to make sure we've got lots of good content filled with keywords on every single page. Okay, so let's get into some of the details that, that you would be doing on the back end of your website as you're doing this SEO optimization. So let's first start talking about this little thing called the Google Snippet. You also see this, you know, called metadata a lot of times. 
but on any website builder, even in Wix and some of those more simple website builders, uh, for every page, you can specify this information uh, here. So this is what this particular product looks like when it shows up in a Google search listing. And all the things listed here are things we can control on the back end of our website. So um, the first thing we have here is what we call the permalink or URL, different website builders call it different things. So this just shows the link to our, you know, that particular product page. Then you have the page title. Um, some websites will automate what shows up here. I always recommend to people going in and, and writing this themselves, writing really descriptive page titles here. And then we have the meta description and Google gives you, I think it's around 160 or so characters for this. So you want to be using all the real estate that Google gives you with the page title and the meta description. So I put our listing up here and I'll contrast it with this one down here. And I'm going to pick on Start Brothers, which is a, um, a nursery out in Missouri, because I, I know some of the guys that work there. Um, they I don't think they would mind, but I'll, I'll, I'll compare their listing to our listing, kind of give you an idea of what you want to do SEO wise. So our focus keyword we have for this particular product page is um, I think LSU gold or something like that. So we want to make sure LSU gold appears in this permalink in this page title and in this meta description. And you can see we've done all three with our listing there. And we look here with the Stark brothers listing, it's just showing fig trees. And then for their page title, it just says LSU Gold Fig Tree. They've got all, all this extra real estate here that they could be using that they're not using. And that's why it's important to take the time. Oh, let me go back. And, you know, go into the back, you know, back into your website for each page and write out these page titles, add more descriptors for whatever you're selling or whatever service you're offering there. That way you use all that good real estate that Google gives you. Same thing here. They're using almost all the uh, what Google lets you have with the meta description there, but not quite all of it. So that's another thing, you know, hand write these meta descriptions. That way uh, you can uh, take advantage of, you know, all the exposure Google is trying to give you with every single listing. All right, some more SEO tips here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, when you're on in any kind of website builder and you're typing up copy for a page, you'll have you can change the style of the text to paragraph or some type of heading. So when you're typing a blog or whatever, you'll have paragraph text, which is just this basic text here. And then when you want to add a heading, you'll have the choice of an H1 heading, an H2 heading, H3, H4, whatever. Uh, and H1 headings are bigger than H2 headings, which are bigger than H3 headings and, and so on. Google really likes these H2 headings. And this is really easy to do as you're typing a blog or typing a product description. You know, you've got your heading here. You just highlight that or um, and then tell your editor that you want that to be an H2 tag. So it's really important to have your focus key keywords in those H2 tags. That really helps out with SEO and have as many, um, or, or I won't say have as many, have a lot of these H2 tags in your content to kind of divide up paragraphs. Um, you don't want just long, long strings of just text with no headings. Use these headings to your advantage to make it more readable and also help out with your SEO. Another thing, this is probably the one thing people uh, that that I see people having, you know, not knowing about as far as SEO optimization, and that is image names. So this is just a little screenshot from my MacBook of my file directory um, where I have images for different fig trees we sell on our website. And I have a naming convention that I like to use where I have the name of the product which should include the focus keyword and then i always put the size of the image right below that so um 
this these particular images are 1080 pixels by 1080 pixels, which means it's a square image. And this is important because when you're designing a website uh, or modifying a website, in some spots on the website, a square image may work better. In some spots on the website, a, a more vertical or horizontal image may work better. And so we have, you know, different variations of all our product pictures here. We have some that are square, some that are more uh, rectangular, widescreen. And so we don't have to go into each image and, and right click and hit get info and see what the dimensions are when we put that at the end of each image names that makes things really easy. But anyway, back to the SEO here, for each of your images that you have on your website, you wanna have the focus keyword for that page in the image name, and you wanna separate the words with a dash here, not an underscore, but a dash. And one way, to, this is a quick way to tell if any website is SEO optimized, if you're on a product page or any other page, if you right click on an image and click open in new tab up at the top, it will show you what the image name is. That's a quick way I'm able to see if there's any good SEO on a website or not. Uh, most often companies are not taking advantage of this right here. Yes, takes a little time, takes a little bit of organization, the way you have your files done and everything but make sure you have your images named well with those focus keywords in the image name. And then uh, another thing here is inbound and outbound links. So inbound links are links to other places on your website. Outbound links are uh, links away from your website. So we're, we're writing a blog. This was a blog, I think, uh, this screenshot and this one. This was a blog I wrote on all the different LSU varieties we have in our orchard. And so every time I mentioned a variety we carry, I would link to that product page. That would be an inbound link. So we like to sprinkle those in our content, whether it be on a blog or product page, services page, whatever. Outbound links are a little trickier because you really don't want to send someone away from your website, right? They're on your website. You want them to either buy something, fill out a contact form, you know, sign up for an email list. You really don't want to be sending them away from your website. But you can get creative with these outbound links. If you've got a YouTube channel, it's really easy. So one thing we do is we'll we'll sprinkle in links to YouTube videos in our blogs and our product page descriptions and things like that. And Google counts those as outbound links. Although we're really not taking someone to another website, we just take them to our YouTube channel. When you're setting these outbound links, each website editor, whatever you're using, should give you the option to open that link in a new tab. You always want to make sure you click that. You don't want to be taking people away from the page they're on where they could be buying something or signing up for something. You know, make sure you open that, have that link open in a new tab. So after saying all that, and anytime I kind of give all this information to a client, first thing I hear is, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. And it is a lot of work. But the good thing is, is it doesn't take, you know, you don't have to know how to write code or anything like that to do it. You just need some kind of some basic writing skills and an understanding of how, you know, of all the you know pieces of the SEO puzzle, so to speak. I can vouch firsthand it, it works really, really well doing all these things. I showed you those um, screenshots from our Lazy Dog Farm site, how we're able to rank above these companies, these huge, you know, multi-million dollar companies just by having all this SEO stuff in place. So, yes, it's a lot of work, but definitely take the time to do it right. If you're a seasonal business, you know, in your off season, make it a priority, make it a focus to do some of these things and I promise you it will pay off. Now the it's there's no instant gratification with this. It's not like if you go on your website and do all these SEO things tomorrow you're going to see your your company showing up on the first page of Google results. It, it takes a little while for Google to catch on to what you're doing. So it's not instant. It it, it could take several months, but slowly over time you'll see your listings start climbing up those organic search rankings. So there's lots of long-term benefits here. You have to put in all the work on the short term, but once you've gotten those blogs and that content on your website, you're going to reap the benefits of that, you know, 
for a long, long time. Um, one thing I would recommend uh, is to hire employees that are good riders. Um, in my experiences over the years, uh, I've worked for other companies and, and hired people right out of college and you know, they might know a little bit about marketing, but they were, they just weren't good writers. And, and that's what you really need uh, on a marketing team. So if you're doing it all yourself as a business owner uh, or, or whether you've got a marketing team, you really need people that are good writers. Cause that's a lot of what this SEO stuff is. It's just writing, writing good copy, engaging copy, making it sound good, but also checking all the boxes of, of putting those keywords in there and stuff. So you know, if, if you're looking to hire some people for your marketing team and you've got a pool of candidates, I would highly recommend, you know, getting each of them to submit a writing sample and really focusing on the ones who can write good because that's what's going to really help you out with this SEO stuff. And then I, I can't emphasize enough blog, blog, blog. You can't have too many blogs on your website. The in any industry, when I'm looking at what websites are ranking at the top of Google search results, it's almost always the ones who have more content, more blogs on their website. If I could write a blog, if I had a time to write a blog a day for our Lazy Dog Farm site, I would. I don't have that much time. I try to do two a week when I can. Sometimes it's just one a week. Um, I'd recommend starting out just setting a small goal, like two blogs a month. Uh, and then as you get the hang of it, as you get a little more fast, a little more efficient with it, you can start doing one or two a week. But a good goal, start out with two blogs a month. you got to get that content on your site. So I said all that to kind of say this. You're probably wondering as we're going through all that, well, where do I do this on my website? How do I keep up with all this? Well, thankfully, there are apps that can help. Um the um for wordpress sites there are some really good seo apps out there uh i've got a screenshot over here that shows you what the apps look like within wordpress i'll go over that here in a minute the one i used for many many years was called yoast um it's still a decent app myself and several other uh companies i know that do what i do were running into some issues with the plug-in they weren't updating it like they should so i quit using yoast a year or two ago the one i use now is called rank math it's only for wordpress but if you've got a wordpress site you definitely need to be using rank math they've got a free version and a, a pro paid version um that's worth getting in my opinion and so this is what it looks like on um a page on the website. So I took this screenshot from my wife's uh, website. So up top here, we can see that Google snippet that I talked about earlier. Um, here's that focus keyword we've set for this page. So she does adoption law. And so we have adoption as the focus keyword on this page. We have that in the link up top there in the URL. We have that in the page description we've also written out that page description to take up all that real estate that google gives us and then we have that meta description right below that and then we have our focus keyword in there so this is something we do individually on every single page make sure we have all those boxes checked and so with this rank math app it basically gives you an seo score for every page now trying to get a hundred out of a hundred is pretty hard but i always try to get the little green light here so that's a score of 80 and above so we try to get that score on every single page we've got a score of 88 on this one you can see down here it gives you kind of the little check boxes uh making sure you've got all the seo things in place so we've got that focus keyword in the seo title which i showed you earlier we've got it in the meta description we're using it in the url we make sure that focus keyword is in the first 10 percent, or basically in the first paragraph on the page uh, we've got it sprinkled around there. There are more check boxes below here when you're using this app. That's just all I could fit in the screenshot. But anyway, these apps make it really, really easy to optimize the SEO on your website. And once you do this a couple of times, it's, it's kind of like riding a bike. It gets pretty easy. Uh, down here, uh, I'm, Shopify does have some um, SEO apps. I'm not as familiar with them as I am the WordPress ones. Uh, once you do this a little bit, you kind of don't need the app. So I tend not to use the apps on Shopify because just I kind of know all the boxes that need to be checked. But there are some out there. You can see I typed in 
search engine optimization there um, in the box and several apps pop up that, that kind of help you out and let you know if you're on the right track SEO wise. All right, so I know that was a lot of information there, um, but hopefully some of it stuck. I want to thank everybody for their time today. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll stick around for some questions, but if you've got a lengthy question or whatever, you can um, you can send me an email. My email is right there. Feel free to send me an email and um, we can discuss some of your needs uh, that you may have with your business. Travis, we did have one question. Um, Angel asked if there's anything um, they can do to prevent people from stealing or copying their images on their website? Uh, good question. Um, the only thing I can think of is to watermark them. Um, so I have one of my clients, Oaks Daylilies, which is actually in uh, Tennessee, they do this with some of their daylily images that they have taken. They put a little you know, logo watermark on those images. That doesn't stop anybody from cropping out that watermark. Um, it, it's it's, it's kind of hard to police and hard to stop it. I, there are companies out there you can hire that that do that, that, that make sure nobody's stealing or reusing your images. I would say the most important thing is just having those images titled properly. Because if somebody steals that image online, they're not likely to title it the same way you had it titled. Um, so... I wouldn't worry about people stealing images as much as I would focus on, okay, are my images titled properly uh, on my website for SEO purposes? Because if they're titled properly, it, the chances of another website benefiting from having that image is, is, is not that great. You should outrank them if you, you got all your SEO stuff in place. Any other questions? And I'll so, go ahead. Looks like we've got another one from Tammy here. She oh. says, uh, she has a WordPress site and not receiving emails when I have orders. You should be able to, if you go into, uh, if you have a WordPress site and you're, you're selling stuff online, you're using, um, uh, what they call WooCommerce, uh, which is the plugin for that. You should be able to go into your WooCommerce settings there and, um, uh, and, and put in the email you want um, to receive orders. Or it, again, sometimes it's in your general WordPress settings, uh, but it's likely whoever set up the work website probably put in their email, not your email. So that's usually a pretty easy fix to go in there. And, and, and you can put multiple emails. A lot of companies, they want four or five people getting the order notification. So you, you, it doesn't just have to be one person. It could be uh, several different people. Okay, Nikki says, do you have a suggestion on entering items into Shopify that are sold by weight? Uh, right now, we put them in one by one and have to calculate the cost manually. Uh, I'd have to look, know a little bit more about your business um, uh, to know that. Well, one thing I might recommend doing is, is simplifying things as far as your, um, your product offerings. Um, so... You know, what are the most popular weights that people tend to order? And it, like I said, it's hard to say without knowing exactly what you're selling. But let's say people most often order a one pound, a five pound or a 10 pound. Um, don't offer them every single at some point you have to simplify things for you and for the customer. So, you know, maybe not offering every single possibility out there, you know, streamline it so you just got three variants per product and, and she said it was beef cuts i know that can be tricky because um you know not every piece of beef is going to weigh the same and if you're getting beef um cut by a butcher they're probably not going to be able to make everything be one pound or two pounds what I, i've had this discussion with other companies in this industry and i think what you have to do is is figure out an average cost there 
and, and figure out some way to streamline it because it's impossible to price every single piece of meat out there. Um, you know, figure out a way to put together some kits or packages on your website. That way you're not worried about the individual weight of individual cuts um, and, and just simplify things a little bit. I, I think that's the best route there. I'm going to go ahead uh, and put up our evaluation screen here at the end. So I'll go ahead and close that up there. And then if you guys um, still have questions, feel free to continue to put those in. Um, I will go ahead and say, I'm really bad about this and I didn't do this in the beginning of the session um, to kind of properly introduce myself. Um, I know some of you guys have uh, been frequent Daring to Learn uh, participants, but if this is your first time, um, again, my name is Elena Boyd uh, with the Center for Profitable Agriculture. Um, we're a part of UT Extension and our office is based in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, I wanna say thank you to Travis uh, for joining us today. Again, um, his name is Travis Key from TK Digital Marketing. Um, if you have been on a Daring to Learn session before, you guys know the drill. Uh, so this QR code that I have up on the screen will take you to your evaluation survey. Um, if you are participating for a TAEP credit, um, be sure to fill that out, mark that in the survey. Uh, the link has changed for 2024, so be sure, be mindful of that tiny URL. Um, it is tiny.utk.edu slash D2L serve S-U-R-V 24. Uh, that's going to be the 2024 link. And um, you can leave any comments in the uh, evaluation survey. Um, and like Travis said, uh, feel free to reach out to him if you have questions. And I will uh, get the PowerPoint slides to you guys in our follow-up email. So I'm going to um. go ahead... I should I should mention um, the uh, the Pick Tennessee conference is coming up. I just want to mention I will be there uh, live and in person. I think I have four talks scheduled for that. So if any of you are planning on going to that, and uh, I'll be hanging around a little bit between the first day and the second day. So feel free to grab me, and if you want to talk further, then we can. And uh, uh, doing a couple talks on short form video. Uh, another one on website optimization and um, a talk on doing Facebook ads. So looking forward to hopefully seeing some of y'all there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Um, so feel free if you guys need to hop off to do that. Um, I'm going to leave the open for just a little bit longer just in case.